Welcome to elevate your approval processes, mastering complex workflows. Oh, don't have control of the screens. I'm Bob McDonald, uh, senior Drupal architect at Hollow Muna. Um, I'm originally from Idaho, but right after I graduated university, I moved to Japan, and I was there for 23 years before I uh, moved to Canada to join Hollow Muna last April. So this is my first uh, Drupal talk in North America, and uh, I just ask for your patience in case it goes terribly wrong. I love making stuff, um, and over the past several years, I've made um, several approval systems in Drupal. I've gotten fairly good at it, so that's what I'm here to talk about today. Um, I really care a lot about making sure that systems I build think about the user first, and so I'm hoping to inject some of that into this talk. Um, just the, the agenda for the talk, I'd like to explain how Workflows works out of the box in core, and they go through several projects I've done and what lessons I've learned from them, the terrible mistakes I made. Um, then talk about what you should be thinking about when you're planning a system like this. Go over some tools that I've found to be useful in core and contrib for building systems like that. Um, Show some code examples and then get on to Q&A. So, yeah, let's talk about, or, right, I wanted to ask some questions. Who here has built um, built systems that use workflows in Drupal Core? Okay, a few people. Have any of you taken it beyond what Core gives you out of the box and like adjusted the transition permissions, things like that? Okay, a few people. So let's talk about um, workflows in core. It's like we're cut off a little bit on the top. Hopefully that doesn't affect us. Too bad. Workflows in core consist of two modules. The first one is workflows, which creates the framework for workflows. It sets up states, transitions, and default states. But it also introduces a workflow type plugin manager. Um, and without that plugin, Workflows doesn't actually do anything in Drupal core. It needs that plugin to connect it with the content. Um, there are several work, workflow type plugins available in, in Contrib, but the one that comes with core is called Content Moderation. And that's what we'll be focused on today. Um, content Moderation links workflows with revisionable content entities, and it controls whether they're public or not. And it's basically intended for doing editorial type workflows, send editor, publish, archive, that kind of thing. And so let's take a look at an example of that kind of workflow. So workflows basically consist of two core concepts. And the first one is states, or the stages that your content can take throughout its life cycle on the website. We've got five here, draft, awaiting editorial approval, pending publication, published, and archive. And each one of those states has two settings, whether that, that state is published or not, and whether when you save, you save your, a revision of your content into that state, whether that revision will become the default or not. Um, speaking of saving into states, that's the second concept I want to talk about. That's the transitions, or how you move between states. So let's turn on a couple of those so we can walk through and follow the content through the site. Okay, so we've got three here. A, submit to editor. B, keep an editorial approval. And C, publish. And they're all different colors because um, one aspect of transitions is that out of the box, they each get a permission. And so you can assign roles permissions to use the transitions. And so we've got um, author labeled in green, editor labeled in red, and um, transitions that can be done by both roles labeled in blue. So let's just follow the content through. An author comes along and um, creates the draft and submits it to the editor. And then either the author or the editor can make changes to that content and save it back into editorial approval, which leads me to the second thing I want to point out about transitions, that you need a transition for every pathway through the states um, that you need on, in your system. So if we didn't have a transition B here, given the, the transitions that are showing up, the only thing you could do once you got it into editorial approval would be to publish it. 
Um, so let's do that. So the editor um, decides it's ready to go, and he uses transition C to publish it. But you notice that the editor could also take it straight from draft to published. And once it's been published, another one of those save as is transitions, they could make changes and then save it back into published from there. Which takes me to the last two things I wanted to highlight about transitions. You can have any number of froms on a transition, but only one to. And each from to pair has to be unique. So that means since this published transition already has draft to published on it, you couldn't create another transition that also covers draft to published, you'd get an error. Um, I'll just show you quickly an overall um, look at that, at that workflow. We won't go into detail on that, but that's what it looks like. And then I'd like to move on to talking about a few projects I've built in Drupal. My first Drupal project was in 2015 when I joined the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies as a senior web developer. Um, I just is a climate change research institute, and so they do a lot of academic publications, and they had a publication database that they needed migrated from a legacy Zoop system to Drupal 7. There's a steep learning curve to figure out Drupal 7 theming and migration and um, custom modules and how Zoop stores data and um, academic publishing details. We got it done. Uh, the Institute was pretty happy with it. And so the next day asked me to build a system to, to build a business travel approval system, which they called the mission request system. We also built that one in Drupal 7, um, largely built on top of the rules module, which became really hard to manage once it got complex. Um, but it was pretty successful, and most of the elements that I've identified as being key to a good approval system was in that first system that we built. Um, and then the institute needed a new website. They needed a website redesign, and they really liked the content management capabilities that came with Drupal on the publishing database, so they wanted to do the whole website in Drupal and integrate the publishing database with that. And the, the part of that project that's relevant to this talk is that they wanted to start um, enforcing the publication approval policy that they had as a process on the website. And so we introduced the publication approval process. Midway through the Drupal 8 release cycle, workflows became part of core. So we decided to build on top of that. Um, and of the projects I'm talking about here, I think the, the project itself was pretty successful, but the publication approval process part was the least successful project I'm going to talk about today. Um, it was the first Drupal 8 project I'd worked on and the first time to use workflows. And so I made a lot of mistakes, and hopefully you'll benefit from those mistakes as we talk about the lessons I learned later on. Um, but moving on, we then needed to get that mission request system off of Drupal 7. And so we migrated that to Drupal 9 and also migrated off of rules. Um, and after we had the mission request system done, we added several more approval systems to it. Uh, we needed a system for approving fundraising proposals that were in the works at the Institute. Um, and then once we had the results of that proposal, uh, those fundraising proposals went into a proposal database to give um, researchers or, or fund fundraisers a uh, starting point for their proposals. But then if they were successful, they created an entry in the project database automatically. And then in, while we were finalizing those project databases, looking at the contracts, the accounting staff would create budget lines, which would then feed into the mission request system and be used to fund those missions. Um, and getting a little in the, in the weeds there, but there's one more thing I need to talk about the mission request system is what the approval steps were on that system because it's going to come into, into play later. On the mission request system, we had two approval layers, funding approval and supervisor approval. So for the mission request system, you'd, put a, you'd make an itinerary and what travelers are going to be where on what days. And then you also had to select budgets that would pay for those travels. And each traveler's supervisor needed to approve their, their being on that trip. And then the funding managers of the budgets had to approve their, their travel. And what you'll notice there is we have two approval stages. 
but there might be multiple approvals in each stage. And content migration or content moderation doesn't cover that. So we had to store that somewhere else. And so I'll talk a little bit later about how we did that. And then fast forwarding to today, we're getting ready to launch a new platform for accepting donations for newcomers to Canada, get those donations, and then put them on a marketplace where support agencies can claim them and help distribute them to those newcomers who need them. So let's talk about all the mistakes I made. Um, one thing I found really important to keep things moving on an approval system like this is that the, the notifications have to be have to be there, they have to be complete, um, and more is better generally. Um, that includes the on-screen notifications you need to say as soon as the user takes an action, what impact that had on the system, and who was notified about what. Um, and that helps people to more quickly grasp how everything's flowing through the system. And then of course you've got the off-site notifications. Unless your users are on the site all the time, you've got to find some way to let them know that there's something for them to do. Um, we use email, Slack, SMS would all be of course, good options for that. And then reminders are also key. You send one, one notification that they've got something to do, a lot of people will miss it. And that leads me to the first mistake from the publication approval process. I hard-coded the email templates and gathering the data for those emails and the mail sending all into a custom module in a way that made it really difficult when I needed to go back and edit the templates. But if I want to integrate reminders into it, I'm going to have to refactor the whole thing. So, um, yeah. Since then, I've started using the message stack of contrib modules for doing those emails. And I'm sure there are other good options for push notifications in contrib. But the recommendation here is just make sure it's modular somewhere where you can put, do the templates in, a, in UI, um, get the advantages of token replacement. Um, yeah. The next thing I want to talk about is trust in one of these systems. For an approval system, it's really important that the users can trust that it's fair and transparent and they can understand what's going on. Um, and a key element of that I found is anywhere where you see a request, you can immediately tell what state it's in and who we're waiting for. And that's what I've highlighted up here in the, in the top screenshot. Um, and it's also really important that there's an audit trail. So you can see everything that's happened on the request throughout its entire life cycle. So that's the approval log um, screenshot we've got here in the middle. It says who did what, when. And then every time a transition happens, um, an entry goes into that approval log. A lot of this right here isn't out of the box? No, it's not out of the box. Okay, I think we're back up and running. Okay, yeah, so to answer the question, these are not out of the box things. And this also ties into keeping track of that data about on the trend, on the, the different approval stages for how to calculate, um, like this, this list of who we're waiting for and the, the detail of what the status is of this. They can be kind of complicated to, to calculate depending like the, the budget lines on the mission request system. You can have more than one budget and then you can have more than one fund manager on each budget. Um, and so what we do is when we trigger on a transition, we calculate all of that. Um, who, who's, who's able to make, who's able to take action on one of these? What is the status? Um, we might also build another array um, of user IDs who have an action available and populate that. And then we store them in the state API, which is a core API, it's just a key value store. So we key it by the request ID and store that whole array of all we need on that, on that request. And that data is not really relevant beyond the approval part of this request. Once the approval's done, we can just drop that, that whole chunk of data and we don't need it anymore. And then the last thing on trust is it's really important for people to get an understanding of the overall flow and to understand where they are in it. 
And so if you've got a linear flow, I found this kind of timeline interface that we've got at the bottom of the slide to be really useful. You can see at a glance where, what I've already done, where I'm at now, what's still to come, and that helps people quickly get an overview of the entire process. And this next one is, if you want people to adopt the site, you have to make it easy for them. And that's, um, that means anytime they're somewhere where they could take an action, you present them with a button that lets them do it. Um, every system that I build like this, I put an actions dashboard as soon as you log in. So you have a list of everything that you can take action on, and that's what we're seeing up here at the top right. Which also, these are teasers. They don't have the full content of the request, and usually you're not gonna want people to make decisions about the content based just on a teaser like this. So on this uh, proposal 161, if that user clicks that review proposal button, it's actually gonna take them to the view of that proposal, and they have the actual action buttons there. So that's just guiding them to where they go to take the action. Now this uh, project 112 on the other hand, this is a project that's been automatically created because a fundraising proposal was successful. And we just want the accounting team to go in and add the budgets and do a few things. In fact, what we want them to do are these four things at the bottom of the, at, in this bottom screenshot. And that's the other thing that we found to be helpful. When you've got a big long edit form and you only want the user to, to do a couple of things on there, putting a checklist in at the bottom of the form and then validation that they have to, there's, there's no complex validation here. They, once they update the FDA, they check that box. And then we just don't let them move on to final confirmation until they've checked all those boxes. Just to guide people on what they should do. And I'd just like to talk a little bit about the default content moderation transition interface, which caused lots of problems for us um, on the publication approval process again. But we found a solution with the mission request system, so I want to talk about that. So the screenshot at the top right is uh, the publication approval process. It's a publication that's waiting in a legal review. Um, and the first thing that we see that people do, the, our approvers are a little bit less web savvy, will completely miss that there's a change to drop down there. Scroll past it, hit save, completely ignore the error message that pops up telling them they needed to <laughs> select that and think they're done. Now, of course, that's a training issue and that's like <coughs> using a website, you, you've got to pay attention to those kind of things. But there's another problem that requires us to look into the, the contents of this dropdown. So we're a unit leader looking at a publication that's a unit leader review and we're trying to perform unit leader review. And that means we need to change it into the SMRP review state, which is the next state in this approval. But if I'm a unit leader thinking about doing unit leader review, it's likely that the intuitive choice for me is to click unit leader review and click save. And then I've just saved it exactly as it was before. No change, no error. And I don't know that I didn't do the right thing until somebody says, hey, why is my publication not, why haven't you approved my publication? And so with the mission request system, we found the workflow buttons module, which I really think probably should be part of content moderation. That's replacing all of these drop-down items with buttons. But you'll notice the text in the buttons is also not the same. And that's because the drop-down has states and the buttons are transition names. And so if you label the button, or if you label the transitions with, the, with names that make sense to the action taker, then it makes a really intuitive interface for them to to figure out where to go. And you can see with this, it's really clear which of these buttons is gonna keep you in the same state and which one's gonna move you to the next state. And then beyond that, we mentioned that you, maybe I didn't mention it, but you often don't want your approvers to have to look at the edit form. They just need to look at the view form and make their decision based on that. And in that case, you can also put a work workflows button widget on the view. But in that case, it doesn't make sense to save it into the same state. If you have no opportunity to make any changes to it, it doesn't make sense to save it as it is. So we always alter that form to remove that button. I recently became a, become a maintainer of that module, so 
I'm hoping to get that in so that it's not something you have to manually do. But yeah, it's, it's good to remove that. Another problem we ran into with the mission request system is that we discovered if you put in a mission request and your mission gets, your request gets rejected and you get no feedback about why it was rejected, that's a really crappy experience. And we wanted to address that. But we didn't want to have the, the approvers going into the edit form and, and filling it in there. It doesn't make sense that we only need that, that input if they're rejecting it. So we found that AJAX dialog box API, which allowed us to put an AJAX trigger just on the reject button and pop up a modal, which is what we see in the top right screenshot here, um, for people to fill in a, re a reason just when they're rejecting it. Otherwise, it can move forward and the modal doesn't have to get in their way. And then we ran into another case where we don't need the whole edit form. We just need a text area. If we want the reviewers to, to be able to leave some comment on it and just move on. We don't want it to get in the way. We don't want it to block them because that comment is optional. We just put this text area right above the action buttons. Um, and then one other difference um, in these additional information gathering steps, for the rejection reason, we didn't really care about storing that with the approval. It really was only um, valuable to the original requester. So we just collected that that um, message about the rejection reason, sent it with the notification and threw it away. We didn't store it anywhere. And with these comments, they, we actually wanted those to become part of the proposal. And so you can see there, we've got one from an earlier stage in the approval. And th at this stage, they also have the option of opening that detail, filling in the comment, and moving on. This is the last slide in the lessons learned. And this is one that I'm still trying to learn. And it's about planning ahead before you start building things. Um, and one thing that I consistently, until this last project, have always failed to think, of, think about before I start building is you're going to need to prove the value of your system and the efficiency of it at some point. And if, you've got, if you're building a new feature, you're going to want to know whether that made things better or worse. Um, and so if you can plan out what are going to be the key important metrics for your system ahead of time and make sure that you're capturing that data, then it's either going to be not difficult or not impossible later when you need to capture it. With the mission request system, when I realized we needed to do that, I had to pull down all the approval logs, parse the text for the submitted date and the approved date, and calculate average time to approval. And I had to do that four times a year, and it was a pain in the neck every time. And yeah, it's <laughs> better to avoid that if you can. Um, but that planning ahead is, goes beyond the statistics. Again, on the mission request system, the first time we launched it, I did a demo for senior management that I just to show it, show it to them. And the accounting manager said, oh, this is great. What's going to happen in two weeks when the fiscal year changes and all the budgets change? What happened was I spent the next two weeks furiously implementing fiscal years in the system because I'd completely forgotten that that was a thing. Um, yeah, so <laughs> the more you can plan ahead, the less scrambling you have to do later. Now I'd just like to talk about the kind of things you should think about when you're planning a system like this. And of course, the, the most important, or the most obvious part of that is planning out the workflow. Um, and obviously, the first step is to think about what the states are going to be. What logical stages can your content have as it's moving through your approval system? Um, and then from there, how do you move between those states? What actions do you expect users to take? And I don't think I've built a, in a system like this ever where I haven't missed at least a, one or two transitions at first. But the best way to try to avoid that is to think about the transitions from every angle. OK, I'm in this state. Where can I go from here? How did I get here? Do I need to be able to save back into this state for some reason? Um, like, is there the possibility to edit while I'm at this state? Then I need to transition back into this state. And then who can use those transitions? Of course, if you can identify the the people who need to approve by their role, then you can use the out-of-the-box functionality on that. But often that's not the case. Um, 
the mission request system again as an example. The, the budgets were easy because we had a refer, uh, entity reference field to the user inside each budget. So we can identify which users can approve the budgets. But for the supervisors, we needed to have the organizational hierarchy. And so we looked at the, the Institute's HR system and the only kind of data interchange um, method available was a CSV export. And so we needed to build an importer on that Drupal system and then every time the staffing changes, the HR person uploads a CSV file and the, and the database gets updated. Um, you'll want to know that you're going to need to build that before it comes time to identify those people. And then, again, um, you're often going to have more than one approval per stage, at least if your systems are, are like mine are. And you'll probably use the state API to track that. At least that's what I've found to be the most useful. But you'll want to think about what data structure will make sense for you and what you need to capture. Um, and then back to the transitions. What actions are they representing? And are they the same action for every class of user that's able to use that transition? So an example for, from the donation platform that we're getting ready to release. The donation comes in, it gets vetted by the site admins, and then it becomes available on the marketplace. And then support agencies can claim that, and it moves into the claim pending state, where site admins then approve it or reject it. And when they reject it, it goes back to the available state. But there's one more way that that can go from claimed pending to available. And that's if the agency that claimed it decides they don't want it anymore. And then they can release it. But that, that means that it doesn't make sense for the button to have the same text in both cases. For the site admin, it needs to say reject claim. And for the agency that claimed it, it needs to say release claim. And so you'll need to do alters on those button texts for certain classes of users if you've got a situation like that. And so it's good to think about at this stage what, what those actions should be called for every class of user that needs to use them. And then this is also a good time to think about whether you need to gather additional input like that rejection case. Beyond that, um, now you've got a list of transitions and now you can start thinking about the notifications, both the on-screen ones, what should pop up on screen when this transition happens, um, and also the off-site notifications. Your on-screen notifications will need to include the information about those which, which uh, off-site notifications were sent. Don't forget to include notifications to the original requester to update them with what happened on the request. It's easy to remember the to notify the people who need to take action, but it's, it's a little bit easier to forget to notify the people who care most about the request that, that something has happened, so that's important. Um, and then once you've got that list of notifications that you need, now you have a list of templates that you can start drafting. And this is the time to think about which one of these off-site reminders that I, or off-site notifications that I'm sending out should be a reminder so that things don't get stuck on the system. And it, I found it really useful to reuse those templates and just include a little note in here. This is a reminder because you haven't taken action in three days or whatever the, the thing is. Um, and so you can, when you're drafting that template, you can just leave a place. This is where I'm going to insert that reminder message. Other things to consider when planning a site like this, um, we just talked about it, so I won't drag on about it, but statistics, talk to the stakeholders about what's really important for them and make sure that you can capture that data so that you can report on it. And then you need to think about who needs that data and how are they going to get it out of the system. Is, is it okay if they can just look at a dashboard or do they need to export it? Do they need to be able to filter it down by date or something else? Um, it's also probably a good idea to think about how are people going to communicate about these approvals while they're in process. Um, for some of our systems, we did it with just the comments module in Drupal. We've also asked people to take it off of system and just do it by email or telephone since these approval systems were for a single organization that made sense. Um, I don't think there's a right answer on this, but it's a good thing to think about while you're planning it out because people will need to talk about it. 
And then finally, again, just harping on on the planning ahead. The more late work you can do at the beginning, the less scrambling you'll have to do later. And yeah, hopefully you won't have a fiscal year debacle like I had. So just to go quickly through some useful tools, I've talked about most of them already. And so I'm just gonna share links and point out what we've got here. Workflow buttons is right there, the state API, and the uh, Ajax dialog boxes, we talked through all of them. Um, tools for communication, this first link is a link to documentation for how to use the message stack. Um, if anybody else has other tools that they use for those kind of notifications, I'd, I'd love to hear about it and compare notes. Um, I didn't really talk about how we do those reminders. Um, we do, use a combination of the cron, of cron hooks, the data we stored in the state API, and then the queue API to, if we're doing a bunch of emails, to just be able to send them into a batch to be sent out. And then finally, this last one is a, mo is a contrib module that I really haven't had the chance to use very much because it's, my notifications tend to be more granular than what this can do, but if it works for your use case, it's great. What this can do is on transition, it can send out notifications to the content author or all users of a certain role. And um, it's also got the templating feature and token replacement. So it, yeah, it works well if that's what you, if that's what you need. And finally, I wanna talk about a couple tools that are normally used in development, but I found can be really useful in production for an approval system like this. The first one is mail safety. I don't know how broadly mail safety is known. It's a similar tool to reroute email, um, but what it does is it give you, gives you four capabilities with, in relation to sending email. You can stop emails from going out. You can reroute all emails to one specific email address. You can send the emails into a dashboard or you can just let emails go out as normal. And you can do any combination of those things. So, of course you use config split to protect and make sure that you're not sending out emails in your test environments and things like that. Once you get to production, if you've got a site admin who kind of needs to see what reminders are going out and track um, what things are not getting approved, for example, or sometimes you've got approvers who claim they didn't get the email and you need to be able to resend it, having that dashboard with that capability is, is pretty handy. So that can work well for that. And then the masquerade module, I think probably most of you are aware of it, but what masquerade lets you do is if you have permission to use masquerade, you can switch quickly to being that user effectively on, this, on the system without doing passwords and logins and things like that. And then you can quickly switch back to being the user you originally were. Um, what this can be useful for is doing a rudimentary kind of delegation system where maybe the admins can, can approve on the original approver's behalf with, uh, with a request from the delegatee. They, they delegated to someone, let the admin know, and then while they're out of internet range, that person sends an email and they can do it but it's really easy for this to erode the trust in your system if users can take action on behalf of other users and it looks like that other user did it. And so this snippet at the bottom of the slide is, is code that shows how to identify that you're masquerading and find out who the original user was. And so if you're gonna do something like that, I'd recommend adding to all your notifications and your approval log entries this person took this action on behalf of this person. So that it's, it's really clear exactly what's going on. So I don't know how we're doing on time, but uh, there's a link to a little repo I put together that's got all these code examples in it. Um, and the purpose of these code examples is to make this talk useful beyond today. So I won't go into a whole lot of depth on these. I'll just explain what we've got here. This first one, um, I find it handy to be able to get the transition ID when I'm triggering notifications and things like that. It's easy to get the from moderation state and the to moderation state. It's a little bit trickier to get the transition ID. So I build a service to do that. 
Um, and that's the code for that. And then I talked about the need to remove workflow buttons sometimes or alter the text on them. So here's an example of a form alter that does both of those things. Um, this is just an ex uh, abbreviated example. There's a more complete example in the repo, but this is a method where I populate, create, populate, and send out a message using the message stack. That got cut off, but um, this is that Ajax dialog box. Not all of it would fit on this slide. There's a little bit more complete example in the repository, but the top part of this is triggering that Ajax button, and the bottom is the, the routing YAML for, create, for sending it to the controller, which then spins up the form. And yeah, that's all I had. Any questions? Yes. Um, why why did you choose the state API over like maybe a module your module maybe create a custom table? Like what's the pros and cons, I guess, to that? I, I, yeah, I get, the question was why state API over doing a custom table. I think the, the main reason was the state API was there and it's made for maintain to, for maintaining state data about something, mm -hmm. and so it seemed to be perfectly what it was for. And yeah, for, for our case, it was expedient as well. There may be advantages. If you, if you've got thoughts on that, I'd love to talk about it. No, I, I haven't used the state API. Like I've known about it, and I but I haven't thought of utilizing it for a custom module. Um, but yeah, I didn't know if there. I, I guess I don't know much about the state API. So. It works really similar to conf to config. Yeah. In fact, it's stored in the same table. Um, yeah, it's, it's so if you've dealt with config in your code, it, it's almost the same. Do you use the BCA module with workflows? The BCA module, I'm not familiar. Oh, uh, e BCA, BCA. BCA. Condition, uh, oh, action. that's kind of the new rules, yeah, right? The new rules. Yeah, <laughs> I, ha I haven't touched that at all, but okay. I'm I was just wondering if it was like duplicative. That's what I use on our workflows. Um, so it is, I mean, I think EC is great, but it's also a good learning curve on, on that. Um, because, yeah, it's, uh, you have to dive into the docs on it. Is, the, is this one like rules where it's, you're building a, building in the UI? Yeah, it's it's the sister module to rules. Gotcha. But it's more of that boxes with arrows and circles. And, yeah, you're actually diagramming the yeah. Okay. It sounds cool, but the caution is that original mission request system, I ended up with rules depending on components, depending on components, depending on components, and it got to where when I needed to make any change, I had to be really careful that I wasn't going to mess up some other part. It's a lot easier to manage when it's in code once you get to a certain level of complexity. Although it might be better with diagramming with boxes, I don't know. <laughs> you know pros and cons. Did you share the link to the repo? Yeah. Let me go back up there. I want to ask all the questions. Um, the people who create the original request in your process there, are they generally anonymous or are they you know, users and have IDs and you're in Drupal? So all the, all the ones that I built for IGES, um, these were tools for um, staff of IGES. Uh -huh. And so these were all users who had an account on the system. Okay. There's a donation platform we're building now. That's those are anonymous donors who are creating that. That's the first time I've, I've done that, and we'll see if it was a terrible mistake to allow it to happen that way. But anything else? Yeah. Okay. Again. <laughs> um, yeah. Like I've come into this problem too of like wanting to make a workflow where it's like your manager has to approve a certain thing and you know you'd end up with the core module using like a million roles or something I, I don't haven't even tried to tackle it but so your custom module really is the only solution if you have some kind of system like even if you had an attribute on a user that said they were a manager uh, based on their like position or something you think it custom module is the only way to get there I, yeah well I've, I've done a custom module where I on the publication approval process, I wanted to give capabilities just to unit leaders, and we didn't have that data in the system. But we did have the data of, we had every unit, every research unit at the institute, and we had the unit leader identified there. 
So I built a custom module that would just go through daily and assign the role and unassign the role based on oh. who was who was there. Okay. But yeah, I've always had to do something custom for anything that's beyond just roles because that's what content moderation gives you out of the box. Yeah. If you, yeah. I'm curious if you keep going on that. Um, in terms of reporting and collecting data, like what kind of is there out of the box? What is there in contrib, if anything, or is it really like a lot of custom stuff for what you need to collect? I, I'm reading through your lessons learned and being like, yep, I was totally burned by it when the client came back and said, you know, how many of these have been in this state and how long were they there? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like, what do we Yeah, it does seem like a hard one. <laughs> yeah, and I haven't found a good answer for that. For for this new um, donation platform, I'm capturing the timestamps of every transition, so we can easily do computed fields on that kind of stuff and compute totals. And that data is there, so it's easier to use instead of parsing the approval log. How do you um, store that? Do you use a, like a field on that? Yeah, we just we just used a hidden um, timestamp field for that. Uh, there might be a better way, but. Find out what the lessons learned from that project. I think whether that was good or not. If it's less serious, like knowing the exact stuff, I've used Google Analytics as um, a way to store a lot of things to like watch like web form completion. You know, so, yeah, like custom events. Yeah, with custom like events. Minutes, okay. Yeah, your Google Tag Manager stores. So like that's a because the data studio like analytics has a lot of great. Um, just being able to pie chart anything, you know, graph stuff. So, but it's not. We wouldn't really want to. Money's involved. I would. And I can't right. understand Google Analytics anymore. Yeah. After yeah. that change. Yeah, it's GA4 now. We've taken away most of it. <laughs> anything else? So out of the box with workflows and content moderation, there's not a way to tell when something entered a state. It, it's just it's in, in the state or not in the state. And that's, that's it. It's not a lock. Is that right? Essentially, you know, those are good. Uh, you do know the revision history. Yeah, revision history. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you're about. Gotcha. Did, did did that answer the question? I I think so. Okay, I, I didn't quite get it. Besides so. what's in the revision history, yeah, I'm really just now. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I'm not. I've been intrigued by workflows. I've never touched this. So you can start now the game. Like, oh, workflows, cut to moderation, just to enable those. And then, uh, like you were saying about getting that history, just trying to process that. Oh, right, right, for the history, yeah. Yeah, with, without using custom stuff, I think you could, you could use revisions to see how, like, when things changed. And then usually the revision log entry with maybe, if you just want to use that as a field to that kind of record why something was rejected. Um, and that's what I've kind of done. Just yeah. Being custom. So, with revisions, can you revert back to does that screw up your timeline and your states? Yeah, if you if you give the permission for people to to revert to revisions, that can happen. Um, we didn't give that permission to anyone who wasn't an admin on the site, and so I haven't really had to deal with that. But yeah, I imagine that would would cause jumps in your approval log. This thing got approved, and then it got approved again kind of thing, and so it could be confusing. You, you probably could also log the, re, the revert, but I don't know what event you'd subscribe to or what hook you'd, in, you'd do to, to log that that revert of the revision. Yeah, revisions are individual, so you, you give your people just a few revisions and not revert. Yeah, and delete or alter. The other challenge we had was taking a snapshot of time of what content was like in previous years versus what it is now. Like we had a our short site was that they wanted a PDF of what the form looked like in 2022 versus what it was like in 2023. So the PDF that we were generating was always from a fresh database, from a fresh data, so we never had a snapshot of time. So we had to go back and the new website and say, okay, we start keeping track of better. Yes. One last one. Do you uh, have you found any success in testing? Because when workflows, when you you know, as the system gets older, 
things to break in the middle of some kind of workflow. Have you found any success with testing, like creating, like, right, you know, when it comes to planning, like writing all the, like a Cypress test to automate going through this and test that it still works? Or? I need to get better at testing. Okay. Right. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like a nightmare to have to write something to test that all, so. Uh, <laughs> so let me say, this client that I was burned up with because they had really complicated workflows, and then we like upgraded Drupal 10 and all the notifications went away, like because we upgraded from a 2x to a 3x of the workbench email or whatever we're using to do the notifications, and they just like stopped going out with the Drupal 10 launch. So I got fed up and finally was like, I gotta figure out how to write the test for this. So check out Drupal test traits that Moshe Weitzman wrote rather than Cypress. Mm -hmm. We just found Cypress being so front end and so flaky. Drupal test traits is like, lets you write regression tests. It's basically PHP unit for your existing database and existing content. So you can test the configuration. It's not like regular old PHP unit where it spins up or, or a simple test where it spins up a bare Drupal site from the beginning. So I wrote Drupal test traits like save a node, change its workflow state, which is services to like get at the states <laughs> would have been very helpful at the time. Um, and then I used Symphony Mailer log to capture the emails and then test the emails. So I checked, checked that the subject line was the, you know, the right email went out. Uh, I, that, was a, that was a multi week affair. Yeah. It was like, Before the recording, Drupal test trait, oh man, Symphony mail log are good for, for doing that. And I think we're we're at time. I'm happy to take questions in the hallway or, or wherever. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.